Good evening and welcome to this very special edition, the Reverse Bank of India. I do want to say reserve, but yes, for all practical purposes, it seems to be the Reverse Bank of India. In its 60th award circular, this is yet another U-turn coming in from India's Central Bank that has rolled back its latest curb on cash deposits. It directed banks to question any individual depositing more than 5,000 rupees in old currency. It was just on Monday that the RPI had imposed this stiff restriction and now it seems the rules have changed yet again. Who better? Then KC Chakravarti, Soya Shrai and Maithi Busnurma to take the discussion forward. Thanks very much, each one of you, for being with us. It's only fair that I begin with someone who's been on Min Street. And Maithi, I don't mean to by any standard say you haven't. But let's go across to the former Deputy Governor of the RBI, KC Chakravarti, who's joining us all the way from London on this. What do you make of this flip-flop? 48 hours before they said there is going to be a curb on deposits. People will question you for the money that you put in beyond 5,000 rupees. And now you turn around and say... It's all going to go for KYC compliant norms, no questions asked, no limit on the money that you can deposit. What is really happening? What do you make of this flip-flop at an institution that you were not too long back, Mr. Chakravarti? You see, look, if from the very beginning you see that demonetization is one aspect, but restricting the transaction of the customers with the bank, I think we must examine from the contract act point of view, negotiable instrument act point of view. And then everything is not that much legal. Now, what recently they have done, I think they should not have done, because by that earlier notification, they are saying it is the bank's responsibility to the investigation, investigate the genuineness of the transaction, what is behind the transaction, what is the source of income. This is not the bank's job, you see. Once you have opened a bank account, it is KYC compliant, then the transaction is to be done purely as per the customer's choice. Now, put any restriction on that is not perfectly legal. Only thing what banks should do, they must report. If they feel that there is something wrong is happening in the account, they must report this under the suspicious transaction reporting. That's the only thing, that's the, that is the proper thing. But then, from the very beginning, Restricting the people to withdraw their own money, limiting the restriction, changing the rule. I think that is we have to examine it legally from the contract at point of view. It is the relationship between banker and customer relationship. But we are not following that relationship for variety of reasons. Now, how far they are legally valid, whether this is right or wrong, this has to be examined by the court. Not we can only comment on that. So, but whatever Reserve Bank has let us done, that is the right thing. Globally, that is the best practice so far as transaction in the bank account is concerned. Indeed, but uh, Maitli, I'm going to come to you on this and, and, and then take it to uh, Mr. Suyo Shrai, Maitli, because... I mean, I'm going to speak with a flip-flop in just a bit from now, but the very rule was bizarre to begin with. And, and do you believe it's only fair it goes, the RBI has done the right thing? Uh, here was a rule that wasn't working well, that wasn't sensitive to what the promise made by the government was, and they've perhaps just course-corrected. Or do you believe the, how callously it was thought of in the first place demanded this, and it shows them in very poor light? Well, I certainly agree with you. It does show the Reserve Bank in very poor light. And unfortunately, the entire post-demonetization period, this is not the only instance where the Reserve Bank has come out with some pretty ha ham-handed guidelines. There was an instance in the past also where they told bankers that you must distinguish between deposits made in old currency and new currency. And any banker worth its salt would have told you that there is no provision whatsoever to distinguish between the two. And the money all flows into the same account. And everything is computerized. So there's just no way. It's no longer like in the system when you had a manual ledger and you could make a remark at the side that this is old currency or this is new currency. So clearly somebody in the RBI who doesn't understand things fully and doesn't understand how banking really is conducted, which is perhaps in some ways understandable because you're a central banker, you have no idea of the practicalities of commercial banking. But even so, you need to check out your side guidelines and then issue them before you come out with these kind of knee-jerk reactions because even in the case of the latest circular, which fortunately they have now done a volte face on, it was very absurd to say because you had time till 30th of December. Everybody was told, the public was told that till 30th of December you can deposit this money. And in fact, the government officials had gone out to say, please don't crowd the bank counters. There is 
enough time. Now to subsequently suddenly say that no, anything in excess of 5,000, which is a pretty small amount in today's times, anything that has to be deposited in excess of 5,000, you need to explain to two officials why there was a delay. You're not asking them to investigate, but you're asking them to satisfy the bank officials why there was a delay and there was a thing about a satisfactory explanation. Now what is satisfactory? It's completely open to the bank officials' discretion. And given these times of heightened uncertainty and heightened fear among bankers, almost any banker would prefer not to take the money rather than take the money and then be asked tomorrow, why did you take this? So I think it was a very poorly thought out circular. Fortunately, the RBI has at least made amends. So I think because the public outcry, etc., they've at least listened to the public on gone back. So better late than never, Supriya, in correcting its mistakes. All right, better late than never in correcting its mistakes. So, Shrai, we've bashed the government very often on, on, on this channel and in every other platform on how the poor implementation of demonetization was really done. Maybe a well-intended move, but very, very poorly intended. This blame today, and because RBI is the monetary authority, lies on the central bank. I mean, look at the number of circulars that have come in. I actually stopped keeping count after 20. This is 60-odd something. Don't you believe the blame today, and, and, and let's keep emotions aside, really lies on India's central bank? They failed to live up to their monetary authority compliance, to their monetary authority duty. <laughs> See, I'll say uh, uh, first that I have not really bashed the government, so to speak. I have done some analysis and presented it in public, uh, in writing and in uh, talking to TV channels, based on whatever data that we had available in public domain, about the portion of black money that is in cash form, about how quickly you can re-monetize in new notes, printing capacity, other issues that we knew a little bit about. See, I think we should not uh, so much look at specific individual instances, but uh, reflect more on the deeper institutional challenges that this entire episode has kind of uh, thrown up and uh, revealed to us as citizens, as analysts, as media persons. The problem is not so much whether you blame government or uh, central bank. The issue is that this huge decision that is so risky and so disruptive got taken and has been now under implementation for almost six weeks. And no check and balance in the system, no institution that was involved was able to ask tough questions or prevent this from happening or made it happen in a different way. If you go back to November 8th, on that day you should have been able to tell how quickly you can re-monetize in new notes. You knew how much printing capacity you had, you knew how many bank branches you had, you also knew that ATMs need to be recalculated and it will take a month. You knew also on the benefit side how much of the unaccounted wealth is in the form of cash and that's a very small percentage. The data from tax rates shows that less than 5% is likely to be in cash form. You knew that the entire fake currency stock is estimated by your own agencies at 5, 400 crore rupees. So you knew all of this information was is available with the government, is available with even independent analysts like me and you. So I think it's important to uh, think about where the process failures have happened. First in the making of the policy and then once a policy like this is made which disrupts 86% of the uh, currency in circulation and basically expects everybody to come to the bank to deposit the money and then get new notes which are getting printed slowly by lunchtime many of the branches are running out of the cash. Take, uh, took a month for the ATMs to be recalibrated. It's very difficult to implement this well, frankly. So once you start on this uh, program, I, I get it your becomes point. very, very difficult to uh, make it easy for people to uh, go through this transition. And I'll just say one more uh, thing. I, I get your point. And when I said bashing government, I, I'll uh, come to you, Suyosh, in just a bit. I, 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 Suyosh, I'm sorry. I'll have to interrupt you because I've got a very, I, I've got very specific questions to ask each one of you. So I'm sorry. I'll have to interrupt you. We'll carry on with the discussion in just a bit because I want to get in KC Chakraborty. And you know, we keep talking about the credibility. Do you believe, Mr. Chakraborty, that the credibility of RBI itself is at risk? The perception is that RBI has lost control of the situation. Will you agree with me when I say that RBI perhaps is responsible itself in eroding its own credibility right now? Yeah, that is perception, perception by there is absolutely, there is nothing wrong. The way the things are happening, you see, actually the currency management was the reserve bank's function. You see, yes, government can intervene whenever it is necessary, they feel, but generally this is a Anywhere in the world, currency management is a central banking function. But in respect of that, if all instructions, all announcements 
are first done at a different level and Reserve Bank is issuing the circular, then there may be a perception. But I can only say this is perception. I don't know exactly what is happening. They are on the board. They are jointly doing this job. And that is very difficult. What is the reality? But definitely there is a perception issue. And you see, look, perception issue will vary from person to person. But I tend to agree that it appears that uh, uh, here, Reserve Bank is not at full liberty in doing that. It appears. But that may not be the right thing because I don't know what is actually happening. I'm glad at least you're agreeing with me that maybe perception-wise, RBI doesn't seem to be in control. Mathi, let me throw that question to you. Do you believe the RBI was wrong in the first place to let the government take center stage on such a big currency move? This is the largest we've seen in independent India. Do you believe the RBI shied away from being in the, in the limelight, but that was perhaps not the right thing to do because they didn't seem to be in control from day one and they seem to have lost control by now? Uh, well, Supriya, in all fairness, even under the Reserve Bank of India Act, it is a government which has a sovereign right. And this right to issue currency is given to the Reserve Bank of India, which is authorized to issue currency notes based on the recommendation of the central board of the bank. So the Reserve Bank of India cannot take any decisions on its own. It has to be based on the approval by the central bank of the central board of the bank. And even in this case, reportedly, the central board did meet on the night before the Prime Minister made that announcement. So the formality was gone through. And in fairness to the Reserve Bank of India, um, one is not sure how much lead time they got to get the operational aspect of it ready. Because the fact is that in a country of our size, it is not easy to re-monetize. Take the question of recalibration of ATMs. It is very hard to find an explanation of why the new 2000 rupee note was issued of a different size. Had it been issued of the same size, there would not have been any need to recalibrate. So these are operational issues which perhaps the Reserve Bank of India should have known or could perhaps have told the government. So one doesn't know how much time the RBI really got in their defense. And as far as the credibility of the central bank is concerned, I don't think they've lost credibility because credibility has built over a long period of time. But there certainly is a sense of disappointment that the Reserve Bank has not been able to manage the situation. But as I said, it's very difficult to say whether they were in a position ever to really have managed the situation given the logistics of it. But clearly, as far as guidelines are concerned, this kind of chop and change, that perhaps could have been avoided. And that is purely within the RBI's domain. So certainly there's a sense of, you know, Severe disappointment with how the Reserve Bank has conducted itself post demonetization. So, we've decided to ask specific questions on this debate, Maitli, and I completely buy your point when you say that maybe there isn't a sense of loss of credibility, but there's definitely one of disappointment. My, my large question really is, and, and you know, we, we're talking about uh, this in lofty generalities, but let's get down to specifics. The questions that we are raising Have people lost faith in India's central bank? Has RBI eroded its own credibility? Is RBI dancing to the government's tunes? And Suyash Rai, I want to get you in on that because the perception is that, and, and you know, Maitli was right in mentioning that the sovereign has a right and, you know, the board did meet and a call was taken but this was scripted and you and I and every viewer out there knows this that the central bank met at a certain time they recommended it because this was very nicely scripted between RBI and New Delhi the question is has RBI given in into dancing to the government's tunes on this one Yeah, I mean, the way the decision was taken and the way whatever reports have come out about the taking of the decision and then implementation of last 60 rules in the in these six weeks, it seems like the institutional distinction between the Ministry of Finance and the RBI has been ignored, by, by, broadly speaking. And I think that's a cause for worry. But instead of seeing this as a weakening of an institution, we should see it more of something which reveals the inherent weakness of these institutions that RBI is not strong enough inherently to be able to stand up and say that it's such a statutory organization which will, based on its own uh, volition, decide whether to recommend demonetization or not. So we don't know exactly how it played out, but it seems very likely that the, the independence was to some extent compromised and it happened because RBI was not able to stand up and say otherwise or give good advice to the government about the consequences of this decision. Let me say one thing very clearly that the best managed monetary economists, some of the best monetary economists in the country are working in RBI. They know how money is used, how much of it is used in medium of exchange, how much of it is used for store of value, what are the consequences of disrupting 86% of currency in circulation. They knew or should have known and given our government a different advice before November 8th. 
the fact that this whole thing went through and now is becoming a bigger problem so much money has already come back and remonetization and units is taking so long are just consequences of the decision on november 8th the biggest mistake was made i mean by taking the decision on november 8th and in that the rbi did not actually do enough to prevent it from happening or give better advice to government be in an area in which it has deep expertise I, I, I agree with you there that perhaps the RBI did not know or was not in the position to advise the government rightly, but that is why you have a regulator, which is why the RBI has functioned very well as a very well-oiled machinery for all these years. Uh, Dr. Chakrabarti, you've been at the RBI, and, and, and let me ask you, and there have been run-ins between the RBI and the government time and again on various issues, but on this one specifically, and you know, this is a question we are asking, that has the RBI failed to assert its own autonomy? And so the question that I'm going to ask you is that did the RBI err in letting the government be the face of demonetization, drive the whole exercise, and in the process, it ended up losing control? You see, look, I, I don't know what exactly has happened. You see, whether Reserve Bank is... Because if you see, prima facie, it appears to me that demonetization decision was taken on, the VS of, on the behalf of Reserve Bank of India after the Reserve Bank Board has approved that. That is what is appearing. In that case, how can I say that, no, no, it is government is doing uh, on its own. That's, that, that's the issue. If you see, the decision is emerging. The way it has been put forward, it is the Reserve Bank Board has done. Now, what is happening internally? Look, I have no source. What is happening? I don't talk to anybody. So I should not comment on that. Yeah, but then definitely perception by says that what is everything is happening, that the, uh, the way the thing is handled, the way both are communicating, there, are, there is room for improvement. That much only I will say. Beyond that, it is not fair on my part to comment about the, either the functioning of the Reserve Bank of India or the functioning of the Ministry of Finance or Government of India. It's fair point indeed. I know you will not want to comment on the insights because you may not have inroads like you say right now, but the point that you raise, that the way the two are communicating, is there a perception, and am I, am I wrong to re read into this, that there seems to be a disconnect between the bosses of Mint Street and the bosses in New Delhi, because there seems to be this obvious disconnect between RBI and government. RBI put that circular out in the first place, and the government went right back to say it wasn't the right thing to do. You had Finance Minister Jaitley say that. You had various ministers in the government say that. And then, of course, this, this, this bowing out of RBI, reversing it. My question really is, is there a disconnect of sorts between RBI RBI and the government, Mr. Chakravarti. You see, I, I, I don't say that there is permanent disconnect. Sometimes they say, look, all what I say about the transaction in the banks, it is only Reserve Bank can issue the instruction because, okay, government is not the uh, regulator and government is the owner. But then when you are issuing the banking instruction, banking regulation, it is also applicable to private sector bank. And that's why the competent authority to instruct the banks and banks are supposed to follow only the Reserve Bank of India instruction. I will further go one step further, which is not happening in our country. If there is a conflict between the ownership and the regulation, regulation must prevail. Government as a sovereign is supreme, but government as a owner of bank is not supreme. If government as a owner of the bank, so far as banking transaction is concerned, if subservient to the Reserve Bank of India regulation. Maitli, do you, do you agree with that point of view that government as an owner may be supreme, but the regulator, and which is why you have independent autonomous regulators, the regulator should be the one driving this, and the regulator's voice and opinion should override that of the governments on matters like these, even though the sovereign, of course, has the right to, to, to bring about changes like this. Uh, well, two things here, Supriya. First of all, the Reserve Bank of India is not independent in law. In fact, it is de facto independent in operations, but in law, it is not independent of the government, number one. Number two, I think nowhere in the world will the central bank and the government of the day act at cross purposes with each other. We've seen that in the case of the US Fed, we see it everywhere. So the Reserve Bank government would not interfere in the regulation. Now this really was not so much a regulation, it was a misguided circular. And since there was such a huge public outcry, understandably so, and the government has to be sensitive to the public demands in a way that the regulator need not be. So certainly the government must have told the Reserve Bank of India that look, your circular doesn't make any sense, it's causing a great deal of pain so even now if you see what the reserve bank has done it has not completely removed that 
earlier guideline. What it has said is that these restrictions will not apply to fully KYC, no, that means know your customer compliant accounts. So frankly, it is a little bit of you know hair splitting because there should be no account which is not KYC. All accounts are supposed to be KYC. That is the first requirement. You could have a light KYC as in the case of Jandan accounts or a thorough KYC in the case of other accounts. So the Reserve Bank of India, I think, has been caught between a rock and a hard place. The government has told them this is what we want done and the Reserve Bank has to try and implement with the government's executive decision. So this is not really a question of regulation as much as operation. And yes, I think the Reserve Bank, I feel a little sorry for all the Reserve Bank of India officials and the governor because they've been asked to do something which is clearly beyond their remit, beyond their capabilities because in a country of our size, you cannot re-monetize so quickly. I get your point there. I get your point about, you know, uh, officials being caught in a bind there. But, but Suyashra, you know, the, 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 the one thing that's coming out of this discussion is that the government perhaps must have coaxed the RBI or the government perhaps must have, must have uh, you know, communicated to the RBI the kind of uh, issues people are facing due to that one bizarre circular that came out 48 hours back. My question really is, is the perception really around how sensitive the government was and how insensitive the RBI was and RBI has nobody else but themselves to blame? See, we don't know what is the communication happening between the government and RBI, so it's difficult to uh, do anything but speculate. But let me be very clear, the, the notification was drafted by RBI and it is the RBI's responsibility to, dra to draft it well. It, when it's used the term satisfactory explanation to be given to two banking officials before depositing more than 5,000 rupees, it was for RBI to define what is the satisfactory explanation. It did not define. And this is not the first time that RBI has come up with a vague notification or an unclear regulation. It has done, it done that many other times also. And in this situation, it is doing a little bit more because there are so many rules are changing on a regular basis. Almost every day you have one or two rule changes. So it's coming out more. But it was responsibility of RBI to draft it and draft it well within the constraint that it was operating. And I don't think it did that uh, job. So to that extent, it has to be held accountable. Now, I, I don't know what are the conspiracies out there saying whether the government asked RBI to draft it in such a way or whether RBI did it on their own. I have no information of that sort. But if an agency has been created by the parliament, RBI is not a department of government. It's a statutory organization created by an act of parliament. It has been given the power to make certain regulations, issue certain notifications. When it is exercising that power, that sovereign duty, then it has to do it well. And it is on its, uh, on its uh, I mean, uh, responsibility to do it well and it has not done that. It's very clear in that notification if you read it carefully that came out two days ago. Oh, absolutely. It was so discretionary. I mean, satisfactory explanation, like I've been saying on this show, my explanation to not go to the bank is that I'm lazy and I like to do things at the last minute. But just hold your thoughts there because KC Chakravarti, I want to throw this back at you. The perception is that the government is the government of the day is so sensitive and it, it mounted pressure on the RBI to do so. And those folks at Main Street, they're so insensitive. They have no idea of how people have been suffering and which is why they went ahead with this. Do you believe that that is the perception? And, 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 and do you also believe that the RBI has nobody but itself to blame for this? Uh, that may be the perception, but the problem is that you see what is the happening behind the scene, whether Reserve Bank is being made a villain, I don't know what is happening. So that is not, you see, look, I will always give the benefit of the doubt to the concerned institution, to the concerned people, when I don't know what is actually happening. So that's okay, perception by you can take any view, that's, that's no problem. There is another view that it is government is dictating everything. But I don't know what is happening. The autonomy of Reserve Bank is all an issue. But all what I'm saying that I would not like to enter into those gray areas on which I don't have any information and especially I am far away from the country. All right, you don't want to enter into gay areas, but I have very little time on this show, so I'm going to get quick closing comments from each one of you. And Maitri, let's begin with you there. Do you believe at one level, and as somebody who's been at the central bank and has tracked it very closely all these years, and you've had very powerful RBI governors who've stood up to pressure, who've stood up to resistance, who, who've given resistance to protect the autonomy of the RBI, whether it was Raghuram Rajan or whether it was uh, Subarao, or whether it was YV Reddy or Rangarajan or Bimal Jalan, there are always run-ins with the government because they're bound to be. The, the mandate is so different between New Delhi and Mumbai. My question really is, do you believe Urjit Patel and his entire team right now has been found wanting on that count? I wouldn't quite agree with that, Supriya, because as I said, the government perhaps most probably presented the RBI with a fear to comply on this. 
So the RBI had to go ahead and do it as the executing authority because if you look at the case of the last bi-monthly monetary policy, it was very clear that the government would have liked the RBI to cut interest rates. But the RBI MPC did not and the RBI has three members on that committee. So clearly the governor did stand his ground and he did show whatever independence because I'm not justifying the fact of status quo, you could argue both ways, but the fact is that he did not know what was the government's line. So I think it's a little, you know, unrealistic and little not uncharitable to condemn the RBI for not ha or the governor for not standing up to the government. As I said, in this perhaps the RBI really had no choice. The government had taken a decision, and it is the government's. It's the sovereign right of the government. Yes, the central board of the bank could have shown a little bit more gumption, but maybe there again, because the central board, mind you, has just a fraction of the size of the strength that it should have. So it's a complicated thing. So I wouldn't say that the RBI has shown lack of spine. But on, as far as operational issues are concerned, they certainly have come up in very poor light. So, yes, Rai, will you, I mean, you know, Maitli, Maitli is criticizing it and yet not, uh, and yet she's a little more charitable. Uh, I, don't, I wonder what you would have to say, because there are independent people on the board of RBI. Why can't people like Nachiket Moore get out there and dissent? I mean, you know, it seems that all dissent has been killed within the RBI and outside. Nobody's talking about the fact that if it was fate and comply thrusted upon the RBI, then what are independent directors on the board of RBI doing? I mean, I know it is not a fully accomplished board as we speak, but there are enough and more people who, whose voices would matter in this discourse. You know, uh, you're talking about a heroic act of standing up and resigning or doing something like that. But, you know, as you say, sad is a land that needs heroes, you know. So th I think we should focus more on the institutional infirmities, the weaknesses that this whole episode has revealed. Beginning with the taking of the decision on November 8th, 8th and since then whatever we have seen. And we have to focus on building our republic, building institutions that strengthen the foundations of our republic and not get caught up on so much individuals, what choices they have made. We don't know what constraints they were operating in, what issues they were facing, what cognitive mistakes they made, what wrong information was given to them, what advice was given. The theme, the, the takeaway for me at least as a policy analyst is to worry more about the inherent and deeper institutional infirmities which need to be overcome if we have to strengthen our republic. If we, we need to have credible, competent, accountable institutions which serve us well and serve us for a long uh, period and do not let this kind of episode happen again. So those are, uh, those, those, that's my main concern. Whether some hero stands up is all of, uh, is important, but it's not as important because heroes should not be required in a good republic. Heroes should not be required in a good republic, but what a good republic perhaps needs is robust institutions and men at the helm to stand up there, be counted and be more assertive. I'm going to give the last word to uh, Mr. Casey Chakraborty, who we started this discussion with. You've been an occupant at Min Street, sir. Is RBI not being as assertive and not standing for its own autonomy like you would perhaps want it to or like it used to when, you know, when, in, a, in a different era? You see, look... Uh, perception by it may happen, but what is reality, I don't know. Yes, the way the things are happening, uh, many people who are seeing the Reserve Bank from outside, uh, there may be a view. But I all say that Reserve Bank is a great institution. It has its own internal strength. Time to time, some flip-flop may happen. But I don't think autonomy as an issue which has moved away from Reserve Bank Till it might not have happened, but all we say, we must understand that it all depends on how the existing people behave on the both the side government and Reserve Bank of India. So it is very difficult, yes, perception it gives that Reserve Bank is not in the currency management area, Reserve Bank is not fully assertive from November 8, that perception people having, and there is some, uh, what I call that, uh, some uh, background or some basis to doubt that, that's the thing. But whether actually this has happened or not, I will be not able to say. That is the people in the Reserve Bank and government, they have to say. But yes, perception by I agree with you. Completely out of time on this edition of the very special show, the Reverse Bank of India, and we choose to call it that because of the many flip-flops. The 60th Odd Circular undoes what was done 48 hours back. But on that note, thank you very much, Maitli Busnurmat, Suyash Rai, and Mr. Casey Chakravarti for joining us in this fascinating discussion. Thanks very much indeed, viewers, for tuning in.
find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.